Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to welcome you to the first of our set of three fall webinar series. Um, today's webinar is entitled Oxygen Therapy in the Treatment of pH. Uh, I am really excited to be joined by two expert respiratory therapists, Angela and Colin. I'll introduce them both in just a few minutes, um, but they will be presenting today, not me. So I'll talk a little bit and then I'll, I'll come off screen for a while. Um, I wanna thank all of you for sharing your questions when you registered for today's webinar. I want you to know that um, the three of us worked together to build today's content and really try to include all of your questions in the content. So I really hope that by the end of the session, you've had your questions answered. Um, if not, or if you have additional questions, please feel free as always to use the Q&A box or the chat box, I'll watch both. Um, this is an hour long webinar. We have a lot of content. Um, I'm really hoping we have a little bit of time left at the end for questions. If we do, we'll try to cover as many as we can. If we don't, don't worry. I will collect the questions that you have. Um, next week, Colin and Angela have kindly agreed to return with us for an additional hour. So if you're free next week, um, hopefully you can come back and ask some more questions. I'll tell you more about that event at the end of the webinar. Um, as always, this session is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel um, following this event. So let's get into what today will look like. My screen will change, there we go. So we'll open today, uh, Colin and Angela will talk to us a bit about what it's like to be a respiratory therapist. We'll look at the role of respiratory therapy in pH. We'll talk about the tools of oxygen therapy, side effects of therapy. Uh, we'll look at sleep apnea and travel, and then we'll end with how to maintain good lung health. So before I pass it over, I'll just quickly introduce our speakers for today. So Angela has worked as a registered respiratory therapist for over 35 years and a certified respiratory educator for 20 years. She was a member of a multidisciplinary team for a pulmonary hypertension clinic. So some of you may already know Angela. After a very brief retirement, she has returned to work with public health to fight the pandemic. Welcome, Angela. Thank you. Thank you, and Kimberly. Yeah. And Colin has been practicing as a registered respiratory therapist for almost 15 years and a CRE for the past five years. He started his career at University Hospital in London, Ontario, working mainly in acute care, and a year later accepting a position working in the pulmonary function lab at St. Joe's Hospital in London, as well as teaching in the respiratory therapy program at Fanshawe College. In 2011, Colin accepted a position working for ProResp in London, where he moved through a variety of positions, finally transitioning to his current role in the Woodstock branch of ProResp in 2018. So these are some experts. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Colin and Angela. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to begin. Welcome, everyone. and. Um, it's been an honor for Colin and I to be invited by the Palmier Hypertension Foundation to uh, Association to um, present um, auction therapy to all of you today and next week. So we're going to get started by um, what is a respiratory therapist? And I knew when I went into this career over 35 years ago, and I know Colin could probably attest somewhat to this too, that there were very few of us in Canada but I wanna share with you that respiratory therapists in Canada and around the world, but in particular in Canada, it is a licensed regulated body. Um, respiratory therapists um, graduate from a three to a four year program. They are members of a multidisciplinary team. So what that means is they work um, shoulder to shoulder um, with physicians, with nurses at the bedside in um, high stressed environments in the emergency um, room, trauma room. They work in the intensive care unit. Uh, they have positions in um, the operating room. And then their, their uh, practice can take them as well into the education side of chronic disease management. So instead of just acute, it can take them into the, the side of chronic disease management, where a respiratory therapist may pursue uh, studies in uh, continuing on to become what we call a certified respiratory educator. So um, basically, um, 
teaching and educating and helping um, people with chronic diseases to um, better self-manage. And as well out in the community um, with auction companies and home companies and home care. Um, so you can see it's very diversified career. And I think Colin could add a little bit to that as well. Yeah, so so my primary role is working in the community and, and kind of my motto is whatever a respiratory therapist can do in the hospital, we, as soon as you leave that door, that's where we take over. So there's, uh, you know, oxygen therapy, CPAP therapy, bi-level tracheostomy care, um, you know, other, you know, chronic disease management, like Angela said, and, you know, the, the beautiful part and the thing that I've always enjoyed about being a respiratory therapist is just there is so much opportunity. And it's one of those fields that, you know, we really do feel like we we help people because, you know, at the end of the day, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And I don't think there's a, a truer statement in this earth. If you've ever had a, the feeling of shortness of breath, it uh, it's quite debilitating. So so I, I know I can speak for Angela when I say we're we're proud to you know, have the opportunity to help people breathe easier. Absolutely. Um, so, and we do work with, um, from newborns, uh, all ages, right up to when somebody takes their last breath um, to our senior population. Um, so we are present. Um, we can be present at very um, high risk deliveries of very sick, sick, um, premature infants. Uh, so um, you can see the scope of our practice is um, all encompassing. And um, if you've ever gone into the emergency room with a little one um, with croup or asthma, or anyone having any type of uh, difficulty breathing, chances are there was a respiratory therapist at the bedside um, with the nurse and, um, and physicians. So I'm sure along um, most of you online today, you've probably had an encounter with a respiratory therapist. And I also forgot to mention um, pulmonary function. So the breathing test, that's another area where you'll see, see us as well. Anything else, Colin? No, no. Perfect. I think we can go back to the earth. Yeah, so I think we kind of covered this slide here um, that respiratory therapists, as um, Colin and I just said, we're an important members of the healthcare team and from hospital to clinics to out in the community. And I just mentioned that we provide care for all ages, the critical ill to those with chronic heart and lung disease. And we covered um, the important role that we play in our healthcare system. So we'll talk a little bit where you may see us um, with your um, pulmonary hypertension. What would be uh, a respiratory therapist role um, in a pulmonary hypertension clinic or perhaps um, in the community? So the next slide we'll go over. So a few things, um, as Kimberly mentioned, I worked quite a few years um, in a pulmonary hypertension clinic with a pulmonary hypertension a physician, a respirologist, a nurse specialist in pulmonary hypertension, and myself. So my role in the uh, pulmonary hypertension clinic, which was once a week, one afternoon a week, my role was um, the six minute walk test. So what that detailed part of that was, I would bring the patient into the clinic, weigh the patient, do a blood pressure of the clinic, um, we would do a special scale called the Borg scale, and that really looks at your shortness of breath, how you perceive your shortness of breath at rest. Um, and then we'd get you to do a, a six minute walk test. So we're basically, and I'm sure most of you online are familiar with this, and we're basically measuring how many meters you can cover in a, in a six minute um, time frame. Um, and during that um, six minute test, we're monitoring your oxygen saturations and your heart rate. So the whole purpose of a six minute walk test um, helps the respirologist or your pulmonary hypertension um, nurse specialist and the doctor, if they've made changes in your medication, um, it really helps to gauge where you are at at that point. 
um, and perhaps it's improved with medication, your six minute walk test, or maybe the distance has gone down. Um, and your oxygen can as well be assessed um, during the six minute walk test. Um, and I did mention uh, in the previous slide, pulmonary function studies. So the pulmonary function studies are really important. Um, they do a spirometry, they look at your lung capacity. They also look at your diffusion test. And that diffusion test is really important because that test um, lets the specialist know um, how your oxygen is really, um, how well your oxygen is being diffused into your bloodstream basically. So the diffusion test and what we call an FEV1 or FBC, those are two really important tests that are often done before you come um, for your follow-up in the uh, pulmonary hypertension clinic. Um, as well, the respiratory therapists play a really important role. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's called a uh, vasodilator or a nitric oxide study. This often takes place in uh, interventional radiology, in other words, the x-ray department, with a radiologist and um, so the nitric oxi oxide, I'm sorry, is the vasodilator. And at the same time, they do what's called a right heart cath. And they're looking at different pressures um, in your heart, in your pulmonary artery and that. And um, so this is a test um, that lets the doctors, the specialists uh, know if you responded um, during this study. Pulmonary rehab is, um, a program. Um, it can be held in a hospital. It might be set up in a hospital. It might be set up in your community. And um, it, oftentimes it's an eight-week program, can be a 12-week program. So it's a structured exercise program where you're followed by often a respiratory therapist and a nurse, perhaps a physiotherapist. It can be a multidisciplinary team as well, where you may receive education at one point during the 12 week program, um, presentation by a dietitian, an occupational therapist, a pharmacist. Um, so again, it's a, a structured rehab exercise program um, and it monitors you. Um, usually the program, the class is about two hours twice a week and it monitors your auction needs, your heart rate, your blood pressure, um, other things, doing an oxygen assessment um, to see if you do need oxygen. Um, just because you have pulmonary hypertension, what I've seen in my practice in the years in pulmonary hypertension, not everyone that I have seen go through the clinic ends up on home oxygen. Um, but we do play a role, in, and Colin's going to talk more about that. But respiratory therapists do play a role in that assessment part of it. Um, another part is what we call a stress test and that's done in the pulmonary function lab. So often prior to coming into a pulmonary rehab program, it's usually requested just to rule out any cardiac abnormality that they like you to have a stress test done before attending a pulmonary rehab program. Now I can't say that that's the marker for every pulmonary rehab program in Canada. I'm only speaking from my experience here in, in New Brunswick. That was one of the requests um, that that be completed by um, the respirologist that uh, ran our pulmonary rehab program here in New Brunswick. So um, again, this these are just a few of the things that you'd see um, a respiratory therapist encounters. Um, when you come into a pulmonary hypertension clinic or out in the community. And I think Colin could add a little bit more to that. I, I don't think I can, Angela. Oh, okay. I, could, I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. Like we will talk a little bit more about the oxygen assessment end of things and what specifically we look for, for who needs oxygen, but I don't want to spoil it. We'll get there in a bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. And feel free as we go along, uh, Kimberly's going to um, share the questions with us at the end, so Colin and I can hopefully um, answer your questions if we haven't uh, covered the questions that you have in mind already. Um, so just a quick thing here, what to know about respiratory therapy? 
So it would benefit people seeing a respiratory therapist. It can benefit people with heart, lung condition. Um, so somebody that's got a chronic lung condition, uh, people that have got chronic heart disease, we may see them um, as well and assess them um, with their breathing and make recommendations. Um, for breathing, uh, for people struggling with um, their breath in a critical care situation, as I said, it could be somebody having an asthma flare-up, it could be somebody having a COPD flare-up, or your young one having um, croup that comes into the emergency department. Um, and then, as I said earlier um, in my previous slide, we do provide the education for symptom management. So all that means is um, somebody with asthma or COPD or any other um, chronic disease, it could be pulmonary fibrosis, um, we will go over their medications, in, in particular their inhalers, it can be action plans, breathing exercises, so how to um, manage those symptoms at home so they can have a good quality of life and monitor their progress of the condition. So um, when you come back for a follow-up with us and just as you would come in for um, a pulmonary hypertension clinic, that's what we're doing is we're following you up. We're following you up to see how you're doing on your six minute walk test, how you're doing with your medications, how you're doing with your oxygen. So that's all part of the monitoring of your progress. So the thing that I'll add to that one, just about respiratory therapy, you know, we know a lot about one thing, you know, when you, when you go to see, or when a nurse comes to see you, nurses know a little bit about everything, but we're very specialized in, in what we know about. And, you know, I, I can share from my own personal experience. I, I grew up with childhood asthma. I, you know, took a puffer, had many admissions into the eMERGE department, spent many nights in the London Children's Hospital growing up. And it wasn't until I got into respiratory therapy school that I actually learned how to properly take my puffer. I spent, you know, essentially 21 years of my life taking my puffer imp improperly. And if I would have had the assistance of a respiratory therapist or, you know, a certified respiratory educator, I would have been taking my puffers properly right from the start and mm. it's possible I would have had, you know, better outcomes, but anyways. Mm. Yeah. Good point. Colin. Okay. So who needs oxygen? Now this is a lot of information. This is a lot of words, but I'm going to make it as simple as we possibly can. Now people think shortness of breath. Well, how do I fix shortness of breath? Oxygen. Now, unfortunately, if your oxygen levels are truly low, then that is certainly the case. Oxygen is the way to fix that. But the problem is there's many things that can lead to a feeling of shortness of breath that oxygen therapy won't help with. So this is the funding criteria for Ontario. Now, as Angela said, she can only really speak to New Brunswick. I'm based in Ontario and I can really only speak to the funding criteria in, in Ontario. So other provinces use other funding criteria, but this is sort of the established set of rules to dictate whether oxygen would really be a benefit to someone or not. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that if your oxygen levels exceed the thresholds that the Ministry of Health have set out, there, there really is no benefit to having oxygen. Sometimes there can be a little bit of a, you know, placebo effect where I, I wear my oxygen and I feel better, but physiologically, if your oxygen levels are in a normal range, more oxygen isn't going to help that. So just uh, to really answer the question, we start off in the province of Ontario by getting what's called an arterial blood gas. So this is blood that we typically will, all, almost always, will pull from the radial artery in the wrist. Uh, once we pull that, it's blood from the artery, not from the vein. So it's blood that's going out to your tissues that the oxygen hasn't been removed by your tissues yet. So it gives us a true reflex, reflection of what your blood oxygen levels are like. Now, if your oxygen level inside of that blood is 55 millimeters of mercury or less, well, you now qualify for funding for home oxygen. And most people don't know the millimeters of mercury and what they know is oxygen levels. So that essentially will equate to a level of 88% or less typically. So the general rule of thumb is that if your levels exceed 90%, 
there, there isn't really a lot of benefit. Sometimes there's other avenues where, you know, people's oxygen levels are fine when they're sitting, but when they get up and they start to exert themselves, their oxygen levels will drop. And there is a funding avenue for that one as well, which ties into a similar thing to the uh, six minute walk test, but it's a little bit different. It's called an independent exercise assessment. And essentially what you're doing is walking on compressed air and they monitor how far you walk, they monitor your, your Borg uh, level, and then they switch you over to oxygen and they have you walk on oxygen. And what they wanna see is that there's actually an improvement in your exercise tolerance, that you can actually walk further with the oxygen and that you have an improvement in the symptoms of shortness of breath reflected in that Borg scale. Now, if you'll notice on the lower left uh, section, it talks about a PO2 of 56 to 60. So that again is somewhere between the 88 to 90% oxygen level. Now, if you have a diagnosis of core pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension or persistent erythrocytosis, that that point you will qualify for funding. So if any of you did a blood gas and you were living in the province of Ontario and your PAO2 fell between 56 to 60, you would qualify for oxygen. So I know this is a lot of information and I know this is quite complicated, but the bottom line is if you have a respiratory therapist come out to assess you and your oxygen levels fall in the normal range, there, there typically isn't a lot of benefit to having oxygen. So at that point, we need to explore other avenues. You know, sometimes I, I see people and they, you know, they, they say, I, I have a hard time climbing the stairs. And okay, well, first thing we'll always do is assess their, their oxygen levels. And sometimes they're perfectly normal. And sometimes it's, it's an issue of just their own, you know, conditioning that that is causing them to feel short of breath sometimes they have heart conditions that will cause them to feel short of breath there's our, our bodies are are very complicated systems but uh bottom line is who needs oxygen people with low oxygen levels that's the cole's notes okay so we're going to look at tools of oxygen therapy so this will be Colin and I um, are going to share um, talking about the uh, different ways that oxygen can be delivered. Um, so the most um, popular one that you see in the hostel and in the community is what is called the nasal cannula or nasal prongs. So basically, it's just as it says, like two little prongs that go gently inside your nares. Um, it provides oxygen from one liter up to six liters per minute. When you start putting it up to seven or eight, um, going beyond that six, that's not good at all because basically you're just going to dry out those nasal passages. And if the demand, if you need seven or eight liters of oxygen to maintain good saturations, then it's time for us as a respiratory therapist to look at another method of delivery um, to suit your needs um, to get better oxygen saturations. Um, the thing about the nasal cannula, it is a preferred um, method for delivery because there's less claustrophobia. Um, you can drink through a straw, you can eat with the nasal cannula, you can communicate well. Um, so it's good for short term, it's good for long term. And as I said, you can eat or drink. Um, with the nasal cannula. Now, um, there's a little picture down here to the, to the side here, and I've included that. It's called a high flow nasal cannula. So you would probably often see this um, in the hospital. So um, this can deliver high flows. We're talking like 25, 30, 40 liters of per, per minute of high flow oxygen with humidity. So this would be for patients where their oxygen demands are very high. Um, those demands are not met by a nasal cannula. Um, so again, this is what we would call a high flow nasal cannula down to the right hand corner here. Um, you would be in the hospital most often. This is where I have seen it used and used it. Um, a special flow meter is used with this. Um, 
Yeah, so again, it's with a, a special set, not your typical nasal cannula, but a special set of uh, nasal prongs to deliver the high flow. Okay. Anything to add to that, Colin? Yeah, one thing I'd like to add about nasal cannula. So lots of times people will will call themselves, you know, mouth breathers. Like I, I do all of the breathing through their through my mouth. And they have concern that when they're wearing a nasal prong that they're not receiving an adequate dose of oxygen. Now, the nice thing is that unless there is a physiological deformity that is literally blocking the air from getting into your nose, it will trickle down. Of course, if you're taking a big deep breath in through your nose, naturally you're going to get a higher concentration of oxygen. But if you're breathing through your mouth, as long as it's not fully plugged, you're, you are still getting oxygen. So, you know, just because you predominantly breathe through your mouth doesn't mean that you should always be wearing a mask. I, I encounter that quite frequently. And the best way to find out would be testing oxygen levels with an oxygen saturation monitor, have your respiratory therapist, you know, come by, do an assessment, determine, you know, what is an appropriate leader flow to maintain normal oxygen levels. Mm. And I will say, you know, we do have some people in our practice that their, their lungs are just in, in such poor condition that, that they do end up needing, uh, you know, uh, oxygen on that eight, 10, you know, 12 liters. And, and there are cannula that you can get that are a little bit wider of a lumen. So a little bit wider and, and they are spec to go up to 15 liters per minute. Are they comfortable? Nope. Do they lead to dryness? Yep. But when it comes to eating, as you'll see in the next slide, when we talk about masks, it is difficult. So sometimes we'll have people use a combination of both. It really just depends on that individual's needs. But, but Angela is absolutely right. Once we get on higher flows, it, it becomes quite uncomfortable. But mm -hmm. sometimes we, we simply just don't have other options. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say the other option to a nasal cannula. So if you're prone to um, nosebleeds, um, and, and some people are really prone to them, then, um, then we'll suggest what we call a nasal cup or a nasal, um, yeah, it's called nasal cup or a little pillow. It just sits over both of the nares, almost looks like a little plastic um, mustache, kind of. Mm -hmm. And so that's more comfortable than having the two little prongs. Um, so we did have that. We do have that available at our hospital. Um, so I just want to make you aware of that in case you're prone to uh, nosebleeds. Exactly. And one other, sorry, one other thing about the nosebleeds, just, um, you know, people do say I get really, really dry, even on lower flows of oxygen. Now, the thing that's important to remember is that unless we are on a fluid restriction, we really need to make sure that we're maintaining, you know, systemic hydration. When we're mm -hmm. feeling really dry, usually it's because we're not drinking hardly any water at all. And, you know, I, I laugh to myself when I ask clients, you know, are you drinking enough water? And they say, well, well, you know, I get up in the morning, I drink a pot of coffee. And then, you know, once that pot of coffee's done, I'll drink about five or six cans of Coke and then, you know, have a couple beers at night. And then what did I hear? I heard I drink a lot of fluid, but none of it is actually causing me to be hydrated. And that mm. is the bigger issue why we're getting dry. You know, mm. if we're drinking an adequate amount of oxygen, I find the dry or sorry, drinking an adequate amount of water. Um, I, I find it very rare that we have issues with dryness. It, it can happen, but it's very rare. The other thing that you can get is uh, there's some water-based lubricants. Uh, one's called Rhinaris and another one is called Sucaris. You can get them at your local pharmacy and you basically just put a little bit on your finger, you know, stick it in your nose and it will provide you a little bit of temporary relief, but the keyword being temporary. So you want to make sure that, again, unless you're on a fluid restricted diet, um, make sure you're drinking an adequate amount of, of water, specifically water. Beer doesn't count, coffee doesn't count, pop doesn't okay. count, okay? That's right. Okay, next slide. Um, the oxygen mask. Well, as, as the word mask, um, you probably already have an image. This covers your mouth and your nose. With the oxygen mask, we can deliver higher concentrations of oxygen with uh, higher flow rates. There's lots of different oxygen masks available that you may see in the hospital. Again, um, difficulty to eat, drink, um, more confining. 
um, may be a little bit more um, claustrophobic. And again, we can provide more oxygen depending on what the needs, um, what your oxygen needs are. So we'll just go to the next slide. Okay, so these are a few examples of what's available in the hospital. So the non-rebreather mask, that's what we call um, the non-rebreather, we can give like the highest concentration of oxygen, 80 to 100%. Um, so this would be somebody that we're really struggling um, to maintain good um, saturations. Um, the simple mask, um, if people prefer a mask, we can deliver that up to about eight liters. Um, but the mask here on your right that you see this uh, gentleman with the straw is what we call the oxy mask. So the oxy mask, we can um, go up higher on the flow meter, a higher flow rates, higher concentration of oxygen. With this, we can also do low uh, flow of oxygen with this. But it does, it, it, the way it works scientifically, uh, the way it works is you do get a higher percentage of oxygen. So when we're not able to get somebody settled on a nasal cannula, this oxy mask works very well. Again, not as confining. You can see the holes on each side. But um, I've really seen it um, turn patients around when I, we've gone from a nasal mask to this mask. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, you know, when at least in Ontario, when people end up in the hospital, uh, all the equipment that they use, the masks that they use, the tubing, <laughs> everything ends up in the garbage. So mm -hmm. the nurses are trying yes. to be kind and they say, here, take these home. Now, I have to give a word of caution. A non-rebreather mask and a simple mask have certain flow requirements. So if you put a non-rebreather mask on, say, one liter per minute or, you know, simple mask on one liter per minute, it doesn't have enough flow going through it to actually wash away the carbon dioxide that you're breathing out. So mm. it's essentially as if you're breathing into a brown paper bag, and mm. that can cause you some serious potentially life-threatening issues. So if somebody sends you home with a mask, don't use it until you've spoke with your home oxygen provider who says, yeah, go ahead and use it. Now, I don't even provide, you know, simple masks or non-rebreather masks in the community just for the safety reasons. Like there's very, very rare cases where, we're, where we'll use a non-rebreather, but yeah, almost never. The oxy masks we use all the time. And as Angela said, they can safely be used on any liter flow. We could put somebody on one liter and it's perfectly safe. Now, the trouble that we run into is because of those big holes that are in it, people think this isn't working. I'm not getting any oxygen. You are, it is just, a simple fact of engineering the machine or it's designed in a particular way to to mm -hmm. deliver us a high concentration of oxygen while being safe you just when you're using a non-rebreather mask we're using it in the eMERGE department and they have got a 50 psi high flow oxygen source piped from the wall and they just turn it up as high as they possibly can so you feel the sound you you or you hear the sound you feel the flow of oxygen mm -hmm. hitting you and and it makes you you know psychologically feel better where with an oxy mask you're not getting that same sort of effect so people think it doesn't work but i promise you it does and again it, we just got to get tested to find out what's the right percentage for you mm -hmm. Next slide. Okay, so here are a couple of sources of oxygen in the community setting. So I don't know about any of you, but in my home, I don't have a piped oxygen source. It wasn't in the budget when, uh, when we moved into my home. So in order for us to deliver oxygen to people in the community, we'll first use that little or that blue machine on the left hand side. What that machine is, is called an oxygen concentrator. So what it actually does is it draws in the air from the room and it puts it through these things called sieve beds, which basically can isolate the oxygen from the other gases in the atmosphere. So it then sends it through the sieve beds, oxygen is collected in tanks inside of the unit, and then it will pump out the oxygen while expelling the other gases like the nitrogen and you know, carbon dioxide, that sort of thing. Now, the beautiful part about that blue machine 
as long as you have hydro and as long as the machine is functioning properly, that is a never ending supply of oxygen. They can be run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They will last for you know tens of thousands of hours. They, they're a phenomenal machine and they make our lives possible to deliver oxygen in the community. If we didn't have that, we'd end up with great big tanks and it would not be real enjoyable. So the one downside to oxygen concentrators is that they do use electricity. So you may notice a little bit of an increase, in, or not may, you will notice a slight increase in your energy costs. The other thing that you'll notice too is it produces a little bit of heat, which isn't so bad in the winter, but in the hot, hot summer months, not the greatest thing. And they do make a little bit of noise. So to facilitate using the machine around the home, our company anyways will always add a 50 foot hose or whatever length is appropriate based on your living environment. So we'll hook hose to it. And then basically you can walk anywhere through your home with a never ending supply of oxygen. The delivery men never need to come refill it. It is literally producing oxygen. The other beautiful thing about the concentrators is that there's actually analyzers inside of the machine to make sure that it's producing the oxygen purity that we want. If something goes wrong with the machine, like say the power goes out or the machine isn't functioning as intended, they will start to beep at us to alarm and let you know that there's a problem with it, okay? Then if you look on the machine on the right hand side, that white one, what that is is a portable oxygen concentrator. So the one on your left, the blue one weighs about 30 pounds. The one on the right weighs about six pounds with an extended life battery in it. So the nice thing about that portable machine is same idea. It's producing the oxygen, it's drawing it in, it's separating it and stick and sending it out to you. And it's portable. You just, you know, you can get a backpack, throw it in a backpack or put it on a shoulder strap and, and off you go. It's uh, kind of the latest and greatest as far as technology is concerned. Um, now, of course, they do have their drawbacks. They, they still do make the same sort of noises that the other machine makes, which some people get self-conscious about. Uh, they work on batteries and with the lithium ion batteries, they're really good when they're new, but as you use them, they slowly start to dissipate and they don't hold their uh, charge quite as well, uh, but they, they really are a, a, a very useful tool. Uh, next slide, please. All right, old reliable, our compressed oxygen cylinders. So basically what it is, is we take oxygen, we compress it and send it into these aluminum tanks. So as you'll see, there's a variety of different tank sizes. And naturally, the larger the tank, the larger, the larger capacity that it has to hold oxygen and it will simply last longer. Now with an oxygen or compressed oxygen cylinder, there's a few different options for how we can deliver them. One is with what we call just a straight flow regulator. So what the regulator is, is a piece of metal that goes onto the top of the tank and allows us to regulate or control the flow of oxygen. So depending on how much oxygen you need to maintain normal blood oxygen levels, we can set that amount with the regulator. So what we do is again, do our assessment. And if you need a setting of two liters per minute, well, we'll put it on two and the machine or the, the regulator will pump out two liters of oxygen. Now, if you take that third cylinder from the left or the second one from the right, that is what we call a D as in dog size cylinder on a setting of two liters, that size of tank will last us about three and a half hours of continuous use. Um, and then as you get smaller, it doesn't last as long as you get bigger, it lasts a little bit longer. So just for a frame of reference. Now, the other way that we can deliver it with the compressed oxygen source is with something that we call an oxygen conserving device. So it is a regulator that allows us to essentially work on a breath actuated system. So when you're breathing out, we don't need supplemental oxygen. We only need it with the breath in. So what it does is there's solenoid valves and I'm not an engineer, but basically what it will do is when you take a breath in, the unit will detect that you're taking that breath and it will give you a puff of oxygen. What it does is it makes the tanks last about three times as long. 
So the added benefit of that is that you could then use the smaller tanks or the smallest, which we call an M6, which is the far on, farthest one on the left, and it will still last a reasonable amount of time, like in that roughly three hour range, but truly does depend on how quickly you breathe. So um, the other thing I love about the ox compressed oxygen is they're just, they're so reliable. They, they always work. We never really have problems with them for the most part. Um, the only thing we really have to do is the tanks need to be tested every five years for structural integrity, but they're, um, they're quite a useful source of oxygen. All right, next, please. All right, liquid oxygen. So what we do, we take this big thing that we call a liberator and we make oxygen really, really cold until it gets into a liquid form. And essentially what that does is as we take oxygen from a liquid form and turn it back into a gas, it essentially for every liter, you, or for every liter you get 100, or sorry, 860 liters of gas. So you got quite a bit of oxygen it then also gives us the option to take portable tanks that we can fill off of the bigger liquid oxygen tank. And the advantage to that is, well, you can fill your own tanks and all you need to do is have a delivery person come by, say once a week or so, fill up that big tank and then you can fill your portable tanks as much as you want. Where the downside to the compressed oxygen is that you can't fill them yourself. You need someone to come and deliver them to you, okay? Um, anyway, so fill up the big tank and then we can fill smaller tanks. So we'll primarily use liquid oxygen for people that are on higher than five liters per minute. If they're on less, it's pretty manageable with either the portable oxygen concentrators or the compressed cylinders. If they're on higher than that, you just simply don't get a reasonable duration of use and you go through just so many tanks and you know, you'll know you be out for, for 45 minutes and your tank's already empty. So with liquid oxygen, you get quite a bit more oxygen and it will last you quite, quite, a, bit wire, or quite a bit longer. All right, next. Perfect. So we'll look at side effects. Um, so common side effects of oxygen, we kind of mentioned a few of these things. Um, the skin breakdown, so, and I know that um, Colin mentioned about uh, things that you can get at your pharmacy um, for the skin breakdown and the drying of the nasal passages can lead to nosebleeds as well. Um, and if you're on very high concentrations of oxygen over a long period of time, that can lead to lung damage. In particular, if you're on high concentrations of oxygen and you're in intensive care unit on life support. Um, so that's always a big concern, that's a risk. And um, that oxygen is a um, medication, it is a prescription. Um, so there is a risk um, as well, um, it is a fire risk. Um, and so not to smoke in the home, not to use it near uh, flammable material. You're not going to have your prongs on and have the prongs laying over, you know, hanging over the stove close to a burner that's turned on, simple things like that. So those are um, some common side effects and Colin might have a few more. Yeah, yeah. Just um, the thing I always like to comment about the high concentration of oxygen when it comes to our capabilities in the home, we, we can't really reach those concentrations that are, are really detrimental to health. So I see it all the time. People are afraid to wear oxygen in the home because they're thinking, okay, if I start wearing this, you know, I remember my cousin said, oh, they wore the oxygen and then, you know, they, they deteriorated rapidly. It, it simply doesn't work that way. Your body doesn't get dependent on it. Your body doesn't get weaker on it. It really only helps while you're wearing it. And the amount of oxygen that we can use in the home is, is not a large amount. So what we typically will say 
If you're using nasal prongs as your delivery method, the air that we're breathing without supplemental oxygen is made up of about 21% oxygen. For every liter we add, we can say we're roughly adding 4% for every liter. So say you're on two liters, well, we're adding 8% to 21, so you're breathing about 29% oxygen. When we really start to get concerned with the higher concentrations is when we're on, you know, roughly 60% or higher for a percentage. So it, the bottom line is, when it comes to home oxygen, it's not as big of a concern as low blood oxygen levels. That is most certainly going to cause you more detriment. Just anyways. That's all. Next slide. Um, so we've kind of reiterate, reiterated a few of these things. So oxygen can help you breathe um, more easily if, you know, if this is what you need. Um, it can improve your sleep, your mood, your mental ability. Um, and your body certainly works better during the day and at night because if you're not getting enough oxygen in your blood, it's certainly going to affect your heart, your brain, um, and that extra work on your heart is not good at all for, for anyone. Anything else, Colin, for that? No, nope. Perfect. Okay, sleep apnea. So people with pulmonary hypertension don't specifically have sleep apnea, but there are many situations where sleep apnea leads us to having pulmonary hypertension. So it is relatively common. Now, what sleep apnea is, is essentially as we're breathing normally, there's something inside of our airway that as we're drifting into the deeper levels of sleep, it causes an obstruction. Now, what ends up happening is as you're trying to breathe in, well, this obstruction is blocking your air from getting into your lungs and it can last for, you know, say 20 seconds or so. And then your brain says, hey, you know, something's not right here. I'm not breathing anymore. And it wakes you up. Now, this is something that happens over and over repeatedly. You know, I've seen times where it's happening multiple times a minute every night, every minute of every night while people are sleeping. So you have to think our sleep is when our bodies are truly repairing ourselves. It's when we get our rest. And if your brain is constantly waking you up, well, you're never truly resting. And if you're never truly resting, that can lead to heart issues. It can lead to low oxygen levels, a whole bunch of things. But what we're trying to fix with sleep apnea is well displacing whatever's causing that obstruction to make it so that we can actually breathe properly so that we can actually sleep properly and as a result get the benefits of sleep so two things that we'll use to treat sleep apnea the the gold standard the number one thing that we'll use is CPAP therapy so on the bottom right there's a picture of just one of the you know kind of more readily available or sorry more popular CPAP units, but there's many, they all essentially do the same thing. But what we do is there's a few ways to determine this. You can go to a sleep lab in Ontario. Sleep labs will determine A, that you have obstructive sleep apnea and B, they will find out what pressure we need to keep your airway open. So what the machine does is once we determine your appropriate pressure, then you wear a mask, you hook a hose to it, which plugs into the back of that machine. We turn on the unit and it starts blowing air at you. What that air does, assuming your mask is sealing properly, is it displaces what's causing that obstruction. And as a result, when I drift into the deeper levels of sleep, I can continue to breathe and I will start to feel better over time. Now, as for bi-level therapy, what that is, it has that CPAP component but it also has a pressure that helps inflate your lungs. So we use that primarily when people have, you know, or higher, uh, excuse me, carbon dioxide levels in their, in their blood. So it actually helps with exchange of gas and ventilation as well as displace the airway if, um, if there's an obstruction there. So, Angela, anything to add about CPAP? I think you covered it well, Colin. Okay, okay. That's great. Perfect. That's great. 
Awesome. All right. So then a couple of different interfaces or CPAP masks, ways that we can actually deliver um, the air to the people. So the most popular one in my practice anyways, is what you see in the middle there, the intranasal mask. So that most close, closely mimics our nasal cannula that we use with um, our oxygen therapy. Basically, it's two prongs that sit inside of the nose. They don't get rammed right up in there. They just sort of sit right in the nair. And then you pull a strap up the back of the head and attach a hose to a longer hose, which then goes to the machine. The reason it's the most popular one that we have is because it's, you know, as minimally invasive as possible. It's the lightest that we have, and it's simply just the easiest to use. Now, the downside to an intranasal mask, some people just simply don't like that feeling of something sitting inside of their nose, or it can lead to irritation. If you're not a very restful sleep in your sleeper and you're moving all the time, you've got irritation from that um, those prongs sitting inside of your nose, some people just simply can't tolerate it. So if that doesn't work, our next option is a nasal mask. So what that does is essentially goes around our nose, but doesn't cover our mouth. What that allows us to do is you have more of a generalized pressure and it's, it's you know, also a comfortable, also a very viable option. The downside is it's not as simple as the intranasal mask and it's a little harder to, for us to get a proper seal with the mask. Now, if you can't breathe through your nose, you have a physiological reason that you're not able to, or you've given it a good try and your body just simply can't adapt to breathing through the nose, at that point, we have to use what's on the far right, which is a full face mask. So that is a mask that covers both mouth and nose. It allows you to then breathe through your mouth and still get the benefits of CPAP. Now, I didn't say it earlier, but if you're wearing an intranasal mask or a nasal mask and you do all your breathing through your mouth, you lose that air air splint that's displacing the airway and it doesn't work properly. So if air is gushing through your mouth all night, it's simply not doing what it should and you need to explore the reasons why. Now there's many, many reasons why you may, uh, the air may be gushing through your mouth, but that I could talk about that for quite some time. So we'll, uh, we'll skip over that. But what I would recommend if you currently use a CPAP and the biggest issue that we run into is just this stuff does not last forever it breaks down and the problem is it's not like you wake up one day and it's visibly damaged what just what happens is the oil in your skin it slowly starts to deteriorate the silicone in the mask and when it's deteriorated to the point where it it loses its pliability you struggle to get a proper seal of the mask and like i said it's not like you wake up and it's ripped you don't even know that it's broken until you replace it so the general rule of thumb the manufacturers actually recommend that the silicone portion of the mask is replaced every six months. And I'll say in my practice, it, it's rare that people replace them that frequently. And, but truly it, it does make a huge difference in getting effective CPAP therapy. But what I, I say, if you're not gonna do every six months, if you go much longer than a year, I can almost guarantee you it's not working as it should. So just keep an eye on replacement, it, it's critical, okay? Next, please. Okay, so some people will still need oxygen therapy when, when they have obstructive sleep apnea. Now, one thing that's very important to note, if we are having episodes of apnea, oxygen alone, that is not going to fix the obstructive sleep apneas. What it can do is limit the severity of our oxygen dropping, but you're still having those obstructions. You're still not sleeping properly. You're still not resting properly, and you can still have all the other neg negative consequences. So if you're having apnea, the only 100% therapy that works is CPAP, okay? Um, so yeah, uh, then some people, even with using a CPAP BiPAP, we still can't maintain normal blood oxygen levels. And at that point we add supplemental oxygen as well. All right, next please. Okay, so traveling with oxygen. I know we're running out of time, so we'll, 
we'll scoot th through this as quickly as possible. And I apologize if we don't get everything covered, we uh, will answer any other questions next week. But um, okay, so traveling with oxygen, is it doable? Absolutely. Is it easy? Eh, depends where you're going and it depends on how prepared you are. So if you're flying, the only real option to travel with oxygen in an airplane is a portable oxygen concentrator, that small machine that I showed you at the beginning of the oxygen section. It, um, there's a number, there's a list of them that are approved by the FDA for use in flight. Um, and but bottom line is what I always encourage people, if you're going to travel, talk to your oxygen provider, tell them where you're, where you're going. We do this every day and we're, we're happy to help you. Just, uh, yeah, it does require planning. You're not gonna be able to book something today and then hop on an airplane tomorrow because there are lots of times, you know, forms that need to be filled out by the airline to, you know, that, sorry, from your airline filled out by your physician to ensure that you're actually safe enough to fly and healthy enough to fly and that they won't need to make some sort of emergency stop. Um, so there's a lot of work to do with it, but we can most certainly do it. And like I said, the best thing is give your oxygen provider as much time as you can and we'll, uh, we'll work on it together. Next, please. So I think we'll just be finishing up here. A couple things on lung health. I know that a few of you had questions in regards to what type of exercises um, could you do to help you with your shortness of breath. So one of the breathing exercises, it's called diaphragmatic breathing, and the diaphragm is your big muscle of breathing. So what all you have to do, you can do this while you're standing, but in particular, I find it easy to do while you're lying down. You breathe in through your nose, put your hand on your belly. When you breathe in through your nose, push out with your belly as you inhale. And then when you exhale, purse your lips as if you're going to whistle and then exhale and you'll see your belly go down. So this is what we call the diaphragmatic breathing. You can use your hand, you can put a book on your belly. Um, so this is one way to slow your breathing down um, doing what we call diaphragmatic or belly breathing, but you're also using another breathing exercise with it um, called purse lip breathing that I'm going to show you in the next slide. So purse lip breathing can be done any time of the day. You can do it while you're doing chores. You can do it while you're out for a walk. You can do it while you're on the treadmill. Um, you can do it any time of the day, as I just said. So it helps to slow down your breathing, gives you better control of your breathing. Um, so how to perform it? Just relax your shoulders. Um, it can be standing, sitting, as I said. You're going to breathe in through your nose for about the count of two. Purse your lips as if you're blowing out a candle or as if you're blowing out um, on your hot soup. And you're going to exhale with your lips. Um, puckered um, as if you're about to whistle and when you exhale you're going to exhale slowly not forcefully as if you're blowing on that hot soup for about the count of four so again this is called purse lip breathing helps to slow the breathing down gives you better control of your breathing do one, it while you're walking or doing doing your chores go ahead Colin sorry I was gonna say one easy way to remember it is just to say smell the flowers or smell the roses and blow out the candles. There. I like that. Just an easy way to remember. That's all. Smell the roses, blow out the candles. I love that. That's good, Colin. Thank you. Welcome. And next one. So how can you stay well with your lungs with pulmonary hypertension? Well, one of the ways um, an exercise program discuss with your specialist about if you have access to a pulmonary rehab program, um, that's one of the ways. And if you don't, if you live in a rural area, even talking, um, if you have a virtual call, uh, talking to your uh, specialist and seeing if some sort of walking program, whether it be at the Legion or Rank or, excuse me, anything local like that. Um, so it doesn't have to be a structured program, but exercise is really important for your lungs and your heart too. Um, if you are smoking, then we advise and recommend not to smoke. And there are champions out there 
um, trained people, respiratory therapists that have done um, extra studies that can help you on your journey to become a non-smoker. Rest is really important as well. Um, we don't have to go, go, go all the time. We can pace ourselves and still get what we want to get done at the end of the day. Monitor your weight is really important because weight, um, if we get extra weight around our belly, around our abdomen, it certainly pushes up on our diaphragm, that muscle of breathing, and that can cause um, restriction um, in your breathing. You want to take your medications that your um, specialist, your pulmonary hypertension specialist and your nurse um, has recommended for you to take. And any particular side effects, make sure you um, discuss that with your team. And you really want to attend your follow-up visits with your pulmonary hypertension specialist because that's how they can um, titrate your medications, change your medications, get special off for your next meta, you know, a new medication and, and so on. So um, to attend those follow-up visits are really important. Next. Okay, I will, I'll come yeah. back in here. There I am. Oh gosh, you guys did that. I was, wasn't sure there. I thought maybe we were <laughs> cut it too close, but you know, we'll continue. If you guys are okay staying on a couple more minutes, call on Angela. Yeah. 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 Okay. No um, I'll just say this. So if you have a question, now's the time. Um, we're going to try to wrap up, but if you have one and you, and you want to catch these two today, um, start typing now. I'll talk in the meantime. Um, because there's so much to this topic and I knew this was going to be quick, um, I asked Angela and Colin if they would join us again next week and they kindly agreed to. So if you are interested in speaking more with them, uh, next Wednesday, October the 5th, they are joining us for an additional hour for what we call a facilitated meetup. It's just a fancy way of saying an open Zoom call. Um, so it's a very informal call. Come on, ask any questions that you have. It'll be hosted by our wonderful PHA Canada ambassador, Kathy Downey. Um, I hope you'll come. We won't be recording it, um, but we will be transcribing the Q&A. So if you aren't able to make it, but wanna know what questions are given and the answers from Colin and Angela, we'll transcribe that for you and provide it to the community following the event. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is um, webinar one of our three-part series. So the next webinar will take place on Monday, October 24th, um, and it'll be on advanced care planning. Um, this is a, an event for the whole family, for um, spouses, children, sibling, anyone um, who wants to be part of this conversation. So I hope you'll join us for that. Um, okay, so I see one question here. So let me just grab this open. Um, hi, Angie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Angie lives in uh, New Brunswick. Um, recently diagnosed with PAH, um, restricted lung disease. I cannot say that word. From, oh, from scoliosis. Oh, I can say that. Okay, I thought that was one big word. Um, do we have a pH specialist in New Brunswick? Um, I have a cardiologist and a respirologist. Angela, would you know the answer to that one? Um, yes, we do. We do have a pulmonary hypertension um, specialist in New Brunswick located in Moncton. Um, she is a respirologist, but she did do um, specialized in pulmonary hypertension. She furthered her studies and took, um, went abroad and uh, did further studies in the field of pulmonary hypertension. So um, as far as I know, um, she sees um, patients with pulmonary hypertension um, from all over New Brunswick and including Prince Edward Island. So you could ask your um, cardiologist um, uh, for a referral uh, to her. I, I think that's probably the avenue to go. And I can follow up with you as well, Angie, and give you um, that contact information. Okay. Did you want her name, uh, Kimberly, or I can give it to you offline? Yeah, or? that works. Okay. And then I can yeah. connect back with her. Okay. Um, okay, and I don't see any other questions coming in. So again, if, oh, just on the buzzer. Uh, are we <laughs> answering the questions that were given in our registration? Um, so yes, yeah, so um, at next week event, we will continue to answer these questions. So we try, as I mentioned earlier, we tried to answer as many of the questions that you asked in registration in the content of today's webinar. Um, obviously we didn't get to all of them. 
um, but um, we will answer your questions at next week event. If you can't make it um, between Colin and Angela, we will answer all of the questions provided and I will return um, emails to you individually with those answers. So in one way or another, everyone's questions will get answered. It's just a matter of, a matter of time really at this point. Oh, and there's a couple more coming in. Um, great. Um, we'll take one more. I think at what oxygen requirements are you unable to use a portable oxygen concentrator to travel by flight? Colin, this might be yours. Yeah. So it, it truly depends on the individual. Now, what most of the airlines uh, look for is you need enough battery power to last one and a half times the flight. So essentially, you know, like a two hour flight, you need at least three hours of, of battery life. So as for oxygen requirements, it, it really depends on, on what you need. Now, what the highest amount of continuous flow that we can do in a portable concentrator is three liters per minute. Anything else would be a pulse dose. And we can go as high as a setting of six on certain machines, five on others. But once you get into the pulse doses, it's a um, basically it's a bolus size. So six doesn't mean six liters. Five doesn't mean five liters. It means like a mil equivalent and it depends on which machine. So essentially to answer the question, like if the unit works for you, you know, not in flight, typically uh, we can make it work. It just, you know, you would need one and a half times the battery life. And, you know, the downside to the one that will do three liters of continuous flow is that really the batteries last about an hour. So if you're going, you know, overseas, <laughs> you need a su extra suitcase full of batteries, but you know, we, we always do our best. So like I said, the best thing to do, reach out to your provider and uh, they can test you, find out what machine will work for you, and then, you know, get the questions of where you're going and all that sort of thing. Okay. Thanks, Colin. Welcome. Oh, some praise for you guys. Um, okay, let me move forward. So um, about the meeting next week, I will send an email to everyone who's attended today to let you know how to register if you can join us next week. Um, again, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Colin, for your time and your expertise. Welcome. And you. um, if you have any other questions, anything you really want answered, feel free to reach out to me. And um, we look forward to seeing all of you again next week. Okay. Thanks everyone so much. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.